Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Casey Turner Presents Talk To Me. Today's guest reporting all the way from Nashville, Tennessee is Griffin House. Good to see you, Griff. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, thank you guys so much for being here and joining us. If you wouldn't mind, comment below. Let us know where you're watching from. It's always fun to see how far and wide people tune in from. Also, if you've ever seen Griffin in concert, let us know where. Where was your first time seeing him and maybe some of your favorite songs of his? Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing this and helping get as many people watching as possible, that'd be really rad. Down below in the comments, you'll see a pinned uh, link there where you can go to Griffin's uh, website and purchase his uh, latest record and all sorts of good things and merch and stuff. So um, be sure to check out that out. There's also an option to throw a couple tips in if you want to support this podcast, live stream, or whatever, because uh, I don't know, the way I see it, no shows is no does. So uh, this is about all I got going on right now. Um, but anyways, welcome, Griffin House. It's good to see you, buddy. Thanks. Great to see you, man. Thanks for having me. Um, I know that you're uh, you're going crazy right now. You're, you're in the process of a move, uh, yeah. you know, plus this whole covid thing that's going on uh yeah, both, both at the same time it was crazy crazy enough to go through everything else and then uh, we were scheduled to move in june anyway so we decided to still try to go forward with the plan and now that we have uh we're packing our boxes and we're literally right in the in the middle of i just cleared a bunch of nasty stuff out of my basement and then i'm like oh it's two it's two thirty i gotta go how long have you guys lived in the current house you're in now um the house we're in now, we've been in uh, seven years now. And then the one I was in in Nashville before that were six. So I've been in Nashville since 2003. And my wife, Jane, moved here in 2009 from San Francisco. And we got married at City Hall in San Francisco. So... Yeah, San Francisco has a really uh, special place in your heart. I know for those of you that, for, for those of you watching that don't know, um, so I'm a concert promoter based in San Francisco, and uh, so a lot of Griffin's shows in the last handful of years have been on my intimate little stages throughout the Bay Area. So that's why we're talking about San Francisco here. But yeah, I mean it's a, it's a special place in your heart having uh, your wife Jane uh, live here for a long time and been, and then getting married here. It's so cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy part of our story. I was just actually writing a song. I wrote a song for another couple. Um, who was also scheduled to get married in the Bay Area um, this month. And I was not able to go uh, because of everything. So we postponed, they postponed the wedding till next year. And part of the deal was that I was going to write the bride a song from the groom. And I've been working on it for like a year. And um, her name was Jenny. So I wrote this song to Jenny from, from Stuart and, um, and played it for him the other night. And then I realized my wife was kind of getting jealous because I was spending all this time working on the song and kind of not being there because I was just getting, I was pouring a lot into it. And um, then I realized I could change the, the title from, from Jenny to Janie. My wife's name is Jane. So now she's really happy because I can just change it to Janie and sing it to her <laughs> all the time now. And the first, the first verse their first kiss was in Times Square, so that's the first verse, and then I changed it to our our first time walking through Golden Gate Park. So that was kind so of a, it's kind of like two birds with one stone. You got your got yeah. your uh, your request uh, fulfilled, and then you still uh, somehow wrangled a song for your wife. For sure, she's been waiting for this one like our whole marriage. So finally, I did a good good thing. Well, uh, I mean, me being a huge fan of yours for a long time, uh, and for those of you who don't know Griffin's music, I highly recommend diving in and, and buying all the records, because it's quite a journey. I mean, the early records, which is where I came in uh, to be a fan of yours, they're not the happiest of songs, you know, and um, while they might be love songs, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, uh, dark times in those songs, and that's why I think I leached onto them so good, because I was going through a time of, it, I'm sure you hear this a lot, I was going through a, what felt like a similar thing, and your songs helped me get through that, and I definitely felt that, so um, I'm sure being a songwriter and writing about happy things, I don't know if it comes easier for you or harder for you, um, it seems way like it harder. would be harder. Yeah. Way harder, um, but you know what, the funny thing is, I didn't even know that I was writing, I didn't think I was writing sad songs. I just thought I was writing songs about my life. I wasn't intentionally trying to write sad songs. And if anything, I definitely didn't want to like put out what the kids would refer to as sad bastard music. That's the last <laughs> thing I wanted to do. But I would just, I remember listening to like, um, 
I don't, I'm thinking of albums that were really influential, like um, David Gray's White Ladder. And he, that was, there's some happier, there's some happy songs on that. Um, Ryan Adams' Heartbreaker, which was good, because that was one that kind of gave me permission to just kind of go a little dark, but feeling like if I said it in a way that was eloquent enough, then it wasn't, it wasn't depressing. It was somehow uplifting. Well, so, yeah, and, and your songs can be interpreted in different ways, of course. Um, yeah. yeah, but I finally wrote a happy one. This song that I wrote for um, Jenny and now my wife is, it's like my first good happy song, I think. It's like the, it's like the first happy song that I feel like is, uh, still has, has some depth, because often I think with happy songs, you know, they, they tend to not feel, it's almost like you're pouring salt in people's wounds that aren't that aren't experiencing that happiness you know and you want to ha- make sure i think um that you're telling the truth in those happy songs and not just saying la di da isn't my life great in this one moment when every there's everybody else is suffering at least that's how i can feel when i hear songs too happy i'm just like well glad you're doing great buddy <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> um, or, I mean, like writing a sad song that's too, like, overt, you know, or on the nose. I've, I mean, I feel like some of your earlier stuff is just so well put. And uh, it, it for me, it's separated from a lot of the music I was listening to at the time and fit right in the mold of what I needed, you know. Um, which, I mean, I love, like, the, I love how your music came into my life. Um, a friend of mine in college around 2004 gave me a burnt CD of Lost and Found. And I couldn't stop listening to it. He's like, yeah, check out this guy, Griffin House. And then uh, I was living in Columbia, Missouri at the time. And I think I've told you this story before, but, yeah. and, uh, you know, you weren't touring through that part of the, my, where I was at. And so we got in the car one night and we drove to Chicago to <laughs> see it, shoot, see it shoe buzz. And, yeah. uh, I, I think I've posted a photo of that night somewhere. You're playing a Stratocaster and, uh, your pants. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely fit there. There it was. It was a different look, you know. Right. And it, back in the, but I remember that. I remember that night and how much I loved that show and seeing those songs come to life on stage with, the, with just you and a guitar. And and we didn't have much money then, so we just got back in the car and drove back to Columbia, Missouri, which is like a seven-hour drive, and That's it was crazy. definitely dangerous and not. But it was worth it. And we got you know we stretched that college budget out to go see a, a songwriter that we were big fans of and I love just how organic that that album came into to my life but um I don't I mean I'm curious like how you know in general music kind of came in into your life um you know where did where did you grow up and and what was was there music in your in your life when you were a child or what was your first yeah. kind of avenue in finding those first records that lit um, your heart up music came in in a really funny way because neither one of my parents were musicians or musical in any way whatsoever. I never, I didn't take lessons of any kind or wasn't pushed in that direction, but we did have a lot of music around. And I grew up in front of um, the TV a fair amount. And um, my mom, both my parents worked. So I was with a a babysitter down the street who watched kids and um, I, I spent a lot of days there and MTV was just like coming out. So I was watching MTV a lot as a kid. And um, we also had a vinyl record player and Michael Jackson's Thriller album was like the main event. I I would listen to that. So of course that was, and then Thriller was all over MTV. Um, In fact, I remember when Michael Jackson beat, uh, or no, I think U2 won album of the year or something and beat Michael Jackson for something. And I was really mad. <laughs> I was like, who are these guys? And I was like, you know, four or five. And um, my parents had Beatles records and I listened to a lot of them and um, music just kind of, music always jumped out and grabbed me. And, you know, to, I can, I know that it did because I remember like being in my room rocking out to something at like five years old and just like jumping up in the air and doing the splits and pretending I was playing guitar and like my aunt would pink peek her head around the corner and catch me and I'd feel really embarrassed but that's where I went that's where music took me like it made me want to be playing it or just think about how cool and fun it would be to to actually make that music come out of your own body and um I had no idea that I would do it as a career for a living no clue um so that i that happened all by accident much later 
And this was um, this was in, in Ohio, correct? This was in Springfield, Ohio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's where you're. That's where you uh, born, raised, went to high school at, and yeah, uh, that's where I was born and raised, and um, I even went to college in Ohio. And um, yeah, I grew up in Springfield, and my dad has a still has a tire shop there that he's had for. It's been in the family for three generations. And, wow. Uh, my mom is a social worker, and so yeah, if you if you watch the um, the documentary that we filmed this year called rising star my dad's tire shop is featured in that film in one scene so it's that documentary is fantastic and we'll 100 percent talk about that in just a bit but um so you're you're dancing your in your room to michael jackson and all these records you found um but again you hadn't picked up a guitar or that hadn't really entered your world you were just kind of a fan and yeah. uh but you're also into you were you're an athlete i mean yeah, I was an athlete, so I was focused on that. I played a lot of sports. I was um, really good at baseball and, and golf. And uh, mainly golf was like my main focus where I was able to, to compete and do really well, though. And uh, almost went in that direction to college, but ended up feeling kind of burnt out and just like I didn't want to spend the rest of my four years at college just only doing that. I wanted to be able to dream a little bit bigger than that or see what else life was about. So I ended up not doing that. And I went to Miami University and that's kind of where I started playing music. So what, what did you, did you have a major in college? What was your, what was your? It ended up focus? being um, creative writing and English literature, which was great for what I do now. It's, <laughs> it started as in zoology and uh, went into international studies. So I changed majors halfway through my sophomore year, which is a lot of catch up work, but it was the creative writing and all those poetry classes and, and reading, I think really helped m my mind expand for songwriting for sure. So it sounds like you kind of were all over the map on options of maybe what you wanted to do, but weren't sure if you wanted to do golf or do this type of topic. But then at some point a, a guitar falls in your lap, right? And mm -hmm. does that switch any, have any switches for you during that time or is that just a hobby? Not right away because my my friends played. I started doing theater in um, in high school, which I went to school. John Legend and I went to the same high school, um, and we overlapped for a couple of years. And he was in the theater department, and I would watch him sing in the musical and some other really talented people. We had an excellent theater department, and it was really inspiring to watch. So I decided to try out one year, and I got cast in a play and. I started hanging out with some more like theater kids and stuff and, and uh, in conjunction with still doing sports stuff, but I was really drawn to the artistic side of things and doing theater and acting and um, singing. I eventually got cast in a musical, didn't even know I could sing. So some of my friends um, were playing guitars that were in the theater program and I thought it was just so cool that they could play that guitar and I, I'd pick it up and just go, I have no idea how you even do do this you know it's just you're trying to make a chord and your hands hurt you can't press the strings down you're like how does anyone ever play this thing and um i bought a guitar off of a friend for a hundred bucks it was an oscar schmidt guitar and um, i had it in my room and i took like maybe three or four lessons and got so frustrated that i went home one day and just kicked the strings off the guitar or something as i was passing by and I don't think I really picked it up much until I got to college and I knew that um, I had time. I didn't have to focus on really other, anything else. And I lived in an arts dorm and a music dorm. So I learned from the other kids there and my roommate played guitar. And um, then I ended up joining a band and singing. So I just kind of learned as I went. I feel like that's been a common thread in some of these talks I've had with folks is like with Glenn Phillips, for example, he never really felt super connected on that he was a good guitar player and this and that. But once he could, he did it at a little younger age, but still the same concept where once he could apply like a song to what he was doing, it when it came together, it was like that's where the, the interest got sparked. Yeah, um, sounds like a similar. Once you got those few chords down and could put yeah. words to it, as soon as I could play a chord, as soon as I could play a song of my favorite music, like if I had a, a two or three chord song then and i could sing it myself and play it on the guitar i was like just mesmerized by the ability to be able to go do that um and 
play with other people. So that was really attractive to me. And then also I realized how the first day I tried to like write my own song, I, I thought, well, that seemed almost harder than playing guitar. I was just like, how does anyone write this? How do you write a song? I don't get it. What are you supposed to do? So um, I still remember that day I was sitting on my, in my, on my bed in my college dorm room freshman year and be like, I'm going to try to write a song. And I sat down and I said, this is the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> so, and um, yeah, it's, it's, but it's, uh, it's turned out to be such a, turned out to be what I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how that, like, and I know there's a lot of organic pieces that kind of make this story fall together. Um, but so, I mean, were you learning cover songs then uh, in conjunction yeah. with that or? Yeah. Yeah. We would go on like online and, um, we're just starting to learn how to use a computer at that point. I mean, I, I don't even think I used email in high school at all. And then I got to college and my parents sent me there with a computer or my roommate maybe had one. I can't remember, but um, for some reason it seems like we used his all the time, but um, maybe he mine didn't work or something. <laughs> so uh, we'd go on there and look up any song on, you know, the, I forget what the, the place where you could Google, it wasn't even Google then you would just search for, um the core oh, like, do like dog oh yeah the uh uh starts with an o i think um i can't remember what that was called it was uh it was a very specific place where you went for the chords and the and the music and and i just thought it was great because you could i knew most of the chords i mean i knew the most of the majors and minors and how to form those i didn't know anything else but i could kind of if i had trouble i could like ask my roommate what's this seven mean and then I would just, he'd show me how to do it. And, and I'd pick songs that I knew had the chords that I knew in them and I'd learn how to play them. And that really helped a lot. And then later on you discover a capo and it's just like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The capo was nice. Cause you could just, you know, you don't have to, you only have to know just several chords and then move it all around. I still never knew what key I was in for the longest time. Um, so just try to do what sounds good and then move it around. <laughs> well, um, before, uh, before I ask you to share that famous story of the uh, pizza place and, and gigging on the street and making a couple bucks for the first time, uh, can you give us a song? Oh, sure. Um, I've been playing this one uh, quite a bit during this time on these stage shows I've been doing. We did a benefit the other night in North Carolina that I played this and it's, it's called Go Through It. I don't really feel like talking right now. There's got to be another way around somehow. I don't really feel like saying nothing. It's hard to see you in the shape I'm in My love is weak and I lost my will My thoughts are racing and I'm standing still My heart's all worn and I know it's true You can never get around what you gotta go through I don't really feel like singing right now Cause I don't really feel like bringing you down All my life when I did was run God forgive me for the things I've done My heart's all warm And I know it's true You can never get around what you gotta go through My heart's all warm And I know it's true You can never get around What you gotta go through Take a little time for my mind to clear. 
I don't know where we went wrong But I know I've been hiding from you way too long Our hearts are warm And I know it's true You can never get around But you gotta go through Our hearts are warm And I know it's true You can never get around but you gotta go Very nice. Here's some applause. You don't get to hear that too often these days. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been to stage it shows every Friday. Well, I've done, last Friday was my ninth stage it show and we just started out of nowhere. First we went on Facebook and just like did a huge, not huge, but we did a free concert for everybody and then just invited everyone and give something, people something to do and tried to spread the good vibes and positive energy and just try to all come together and with some music and let everyone feel like it's all going to be okay. And then I remembered I was doing these stage it shows a while back where you get online and play and people could comment and come. So it's sort of like a real show format in a way. And uh, so I started doing that on one Friday night and it was great. And it's like, maybe I'll try again this Friday. I'm not doing anything else. And <laughs> That worked out well. So just we made it a tradition, and then I think the third night or third week, I played through. Um, had the idea to play "Lost and Found" front to back, which is the album that we talked about before. And um, I think you may have tuned in for that one. Didn't I you? did. Yeah, I saw the whole thing, and then we uh, stage it gives you that time uh, crunch, and you had to finish it up on a Facebook Live. It was really yeah, that's fun. Right. Yeah, then I got the idea. I could do that too. I just go do the encore on Facebook Live and switch over. So I think I may have, was that the night that I had, I accidentally posted it on my other page at first and I had to stop. Yeah. And my, it was like, I started the live thing from Griffin W House instead of Griffin House, which is the musician page. So people were really like, what's going on? I'm not seeing it. Hey, who knew overnight you had to be a social media expert? I mean, uh, like even more so than already promoting your tours and what you already yeah. have to do on your own as a independent uh, touring artist. But, uh, um, you know, Man, I'll tell you what, I, I've been like really starting to understand the sacrifice that a lot of artists are making right now um, with their art that I don't, I'm not even sure they know that they're, that they're doing. Um, Cause I didn't know I was doing it. And that's something that's almost a complete necessity in this day and age, because if you're not signed to some big deal, which is, th that's a very, very small percentage of people. And, and there's a small percentage of people that are signed to deals and then have management companies and booking agents and teams of people working with them to help them do all this stuff. And, uh, I kind of had that for a while in my, when I first started out, um, label management company. And, um, now I just, it's just me and I still have an agent and some people that help with tour press and stuff. But I, um, mainly I'm like kind of the captain of the ship and I'm, I'm like the, um, you know, just the guy that figures out how to get everything done and holds it together. And I'm, you know, kind of self managed. And I was going out and touring all the time and playing like a hundred dates a year and doing wearing that like this is my business this is not my music business hat this is my artist hat <laughs> but i've had the, mu the the music business hat on because it's so essential for artists to to be able to do that to survive and um as the years went by i started to realize how actually essential it was to do it and do it well and it ended up starting to consume so much of my time that i was feeling like where is the where is the artist that I knew like when I made lost and found and I didn't know anything about music business. I was keeping like paper gas receipts in an envelope and then holding <laughs> it to some guy who was called like a business manager that I, I didn't even know who these people were. And, um, it, that's just evolved. And now 
what I'm trying to get to as in a, in a roundabout way, um, long winded way is that since we have been um, social distancing and I haven't been able to tour and there's been nothing for me to go do in terms of um, traveling my butt off and wearing that music business tour manager hat all the time. I've been home and my like creativity artist light got turned on again in a way that hasn't been, it hasn't been on in a long time. It's like, it's, I felt like I've had to really try hard to even make myself want to do my work. Like I, it, it was more of a discipline thing. Like I don't really want to write right now. I'm too tired. I'm my, my left brain's working too hard and I, I'm, I don't have the capacity to go be artistic, but I would still kind of force myself anyway. And as a result, I'd, I'd be able to come up with an album every three years that I was excited about. Um, but that's a long time to, to get some songs together, at least for me, um, when, when I know like how pro prolific it, it's possible to be when you're writing from a place of really, really wanting to, because you're getting, finding a lot of joy. And I've just like reconnected with that so much during this time where I'm picking up my guitar every day. I'm writing songs like crazy. I got have all these ideas and it just feels so good to, I've, I've just realized how much I needed this. Like I needed a, I needed some sort of a sabbatical where it's like I sat down and rested and learned how to just sit still and do music for the love of, of music and like stop, um, stop running so hard, you know? So that's been really, really good. That's great to hear. I've, I've definitely heard a mixed review of that kind of um, impression on what this time has meant for people. And, you know, I'm sure for you also having a family uh, added into those tour dates a year, like you were saying, like you're out there playing the shows, supporting your family, but then where is that creative time, that downtime to actually put pen to paper? Yeah. Be, it's hard to write songs, I'm sure, with uh, with someone in the room over to you or if you got to like change diapers or yeah. you know th those interruptions um, or you're just if you're getting on a plane every two weeks you know right. and then gone for a week and then you come home it takes a week just to reset and there's just never any there's never enough time to really get into a rhythm um and i i found that i'm i'm a routine oriented person and that helps me a lot when i can when i can know what i'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis and have some structure um I'll also say this just because it's true, not that it's like really, not that anyone really cares, but maybe it'll help somebody. Um, I, so before, I think the documentary like touches on this a little bit, but it's just like, I think I was someone who really thought about a lot about why he seemed uncomfortable in the world so much or like uncomfortable with something, uncomfortable with myself. Um, probably some definitely some struggles with like anxiety and depression over that and uh just really in my head a lot and not and usually okay but like once in a while i'd go into like a a little bit of a spin where i'd, I'd just be real down for like a few days and then this the other thing that I, i'm just saying this because it's been a i know this isn't everyone's experience this has just been my experience where as soon as some of this stuff started happening and the whole world as we knew it like turned upside down and some of the craziness actually that is in this world that we're doing that we, we've just turned a blind eye to a lot because we're so busy just doing 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 and we, we're not taking the time to stop and look around and really asking why or, or maybe we need to re-examine this as soon as everything slowed down and the world seemed almost more crazy. Like I just got this huge shot of peace and tran tranquility because it was almost like everybody else seemed to stop and recognize with me that like, Hey, the world's insane. Like it's absolutely insane. And so that's kind of my point is like, I think I felt like I was um, struggling trying to keep up with uh, the pace at which the world was moving that everyone else was telling me I was supposed to um, go right along with. And now that it's slowed down, I'm like, man, I, this is like more where the pace of like more where I come from and what I'm comfortable with. And I mean, I like moving too. I like 
working hard. I like to learn. And actually, I talked to Poltsy the other day, Steve Poltz, I remember was on here before, and he said something similar, was just, which was just kind of, man, everyone thought I was going to, like, lose my mind if I wasn't touring. Because you know me, I do, like, 250 dates a year or whatever he does. Uh, he works really hard, and, and, and uh, he's like, turns out I'm, I'm just fine, you know? And it's sort of, it's sort of the same thing. And um, so I, it's interesting, like, I don't know how this is going to shake out when it all starts again, because I know, I know now that I sort of have a different perspective of like, I love touring. That's like the, the catch 22 as well. It's like, I love touring and it's made me appreciate what an absolute blessing it has been to get to play all of the shows live for people over the years, which is another aspect of like the film that I wish I had had that perspective when we made the film, just to be able to say, and I'm the luckiest guy on earth. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, that's my perspective now. I just feel like the luckiest dude ever to get to go have been able to do all this stuff. And um, I feel like the film touches on that though at the end. I mean, I you, so. you come across at the end because there's like some ups that's and down, true. up and down yeah, like true. moments in filming where you walk in the club and no one's there to greet you and you're, yeah. you know, uh, and I feel like at the end of the, in the film we're talking about, if you don't know, um, it's called Rising Star. It's a documentary that was recently put out. Um, following griffin house around and I, I believe you can watch it on amazon still or I where's the best place yeah uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's really great uh i really enjoyed it for two fronts like like griffin's my friend and seen and i've i've been on those road tours and seen people go through those ups and downs and and but it was really well done and really well captured and it really captures you too and uh so i highly recommend uh going and looking that up after you watch this guys for sure <laughs> It's really good. And then there's also a soundtrack to complement it, uh, yeah. on you, which you can purchase on his website, which will be in the link below. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, to jump a little bit back on the timeline here. So um, you got the guitar in your hand. You're starting to put words to chords. Um, and for anyone that's seen you live, I know they've heard this story. But for folks who haven't, you know, the day you kind of stepped out of your comfort zone and played in front of people and had a couple dollars in front of you. Can you share that story for us? Oh, yeah. Um, I was, I just got back from Europe. I was, uh, I did that thing that everybody seemed to do back in the day, which was like backpack around Europe only. I was actually going to school there. I was on an exchange program and, um, starting to write songs. And I came back to live in Cincinnati with this band. Um, we were, were going to play out at night and make some recordings and we were all working odd jobs. So, um, I worked at a, uh, pizzeria called Uno's Pizzeria downtown Cincinnati and I wasn't wasn't making any tips I had lied on my application said I had experience as a server but I had none at all and uh, I was just not making any money I wasn't doing well uh, at all and I last day on the job I think I was I got cut from my shift after like five or six hours and I had only made two or three bucks in tips I think it was two dollars and 25 cents actually that's the figure that I usually refer to <laughs> and uh so I decided I'm going to do what I did in Europe for some extra money sometimes, which was just take my guitar down to a public area and start playing. And so I, uh, I always say I had a little purple French fry basket that I may or may not have lifted from Uno's Pizzeria. And I put on note on the front of it that says my real job pays $2.25. And I started playing down in Hyde Park Square. And that evening that I played for a couple hours down there, I made like 50 or 60 bucks in this basket. It was like a miracle. And um, that's how I paid the rent that summer. It's, and it's, uh, I, I just tell the audiences, it's pretty much how I've been paying the rent ever since that day. So that was a um, definitely a turning point in realizing that just paying the rent, you know, it's like, and I, I wasn't even thinking, I didn't even use words like career or like, Job. I didn't think of music that way at all. I didn't think of it from a business standpoint, but I thought it, it opened my eyes to sit, to see, hey, I can do music and write the kind of songs that I want to write, and it could pay my rent too, which is amazing. And I started to see that I didn't have to go work this other job. I could actually possibly make some money doing my music, which was pretty eye-opening. And um, that's kind of what I started to do. So you discovered that you could sing when you were doing musicals in, in uh, you said high school, correct? You're like, yeah, oh, I, can, I, I got to sing. 
I got in this play, this one act play. Um, they did this cool thing at our, our high school in the winter time. Instead of using the auditorium, they would set bleachers up on the actual stage and create a really tiny little amphitheater. And they'd do <laughs> one act plays and they'd do like, they'd select six or seven or eight. And um, they did that through the winter time. And uh, I got cast in this play called Where Have All the Lightning Bugs Gone? And it was me and this other girl. And um, so I had to, but that was a lot of lines to remember. And my first time ever doing it. And I got cast and worked really hard. And it, and it turned out like I could do it. Like I could go be in part of the play. And it felt a little, it felt pretty natural to me. And then the second time I, I got a, some praise for that, I suppose, and made me feel good. So I tried out for the musical and not thinking they would cast me in a singing part, but they did. They cast me Judd Fry, the bad guy. And in the movie, he doesn't have his own song. Um, but in the, uh, in the actual play, he has his own song called Lonely Room. So I had like my own solo there in the spotlight in front of this, you know, auditorium full of people. And that was great because it gave me, it made me realize how much I, I really loved singing for people and um, getting, getting feedback or feeling like, hey, what, I, what you just did actually was moving. Like it was actually really moved me and thought it was really great. And that, um, that was just like really intoxicating for me to feel that 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 was possible to do something like that because it was something it was like a talent that I had that I never knew I had until that that moment never 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 knew it you know and wouldn't even have dreamed that anyone would go oh my god have you heard Griffin sing he can sing I was like really that's news to me <laughs> you know like I so you, you do have a really nice effortless like delivery in your voice that I think would make a lot of people who work hard <laughs> trying to be a singer jealous uh, uh, because you've got a really big range but your tone and uh, uh, it just it just really cuts through like you know it's kind of the thing I've said if I can hear someone and you hear a song on a record like you really show up in your records uh, and I've noticed like you know, there's only a handful of people I know that really show up on recording and then also can do it live, you know, where yeah. you take away the record and you're like, oh, I'm still experiencing this, this uh, voice. And, but well, that's pretty, so, yeah. To hear them say that is really funny though. Cause the song was like, I can't remember the whole thing, but it was like the floor creaks, the door squeaks. There's a field mouse and nibbling on a broom. I'm awake in a lonely room. It was like, <laughs> it was like that kind of stuff. But they gave me this tape to practice with, and I'd practice with this cassette tape in my car, and that's how I learned to do it. And then I knew I could do that, and I knew I could match what they were doing. But what I didn't know how to do was, like, go sit by the guy who was playing it on piano, and he plays it, and there's no one else singing. And then they go, okay, sing. And I would go, uh, what? <laughs> so he... With the little training wheels, he'd have to like start, start me. And then I go, uh, uh, okay, yeah, I'm riding. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> and, uh, that's kind of how, that's exactly how I learned to sing. It was just literally like that. It was like, I had no idea what I was doing and then just kind of wanted to do it so bad. It was like, get me on that bike. I'm going to ride this thing. <laughs> well, I mean, that's works out great because, I mean, if you've got that confidence at a young age and then you're stepping out into the street with a French fry basket at least you know what's coming out of here is you're confident it's it's good enough that you've got good feedback and clearly yeah, the reflection the, of the tips well the praise helped a lot because it was on it was i didn't have any confidence i just had some sort of desire to do it that was so bad that it it, it was so great that it overrode any fear about it because my desire was greater than my fear for some reason that i don't really understand and then yeah you're right i think that when some people respond in a positive way enough times, you start to go, well, must be doing something right. <laughs> you know? so. That's awesome. So, um, so after you're stepping to the street, you're not, you're not looking back at the server job again. At what point do you start playing gigs and actually have, you know, a collection of songs where you can do a 20 minute set or, or whatever your, op were, were they open mic nights where you was that uh, your first? My, I there? started, uh, I did a few open mics, but, um, and I think I did some of those maybe while I was still in the band. But this summer between like when I quit the job in Uno's Pizzeria and did the busking thing, um, 
I was really, I really wanted this band to work because I was really loving music and um, we were good. We were kind of a cool jam band, but like we just had some personality clashing issues that any band at that age would have. And I was like, there was some, some inner uh, conflict and I was just kind of focused on trying to get some music done. So I said, all right, guys, if we don't have a CD done by this summer, at the end of the summer, I'm out of here. I got it. I want to do this. And so I kind of like let them know that was my position and we didn't get it done. So I, in the meantime, was recording my own uh, record in the basement of the house where we were living on a little 12 track recorder. And it was called no more crazy love songs. And it was 12 <laughs> songs that I recorded and um, my friend in the band helped me mix them. And I took them to my college with me senior year. And I pressed up, about 500 copies and I think eventually like a thousand copies because I sold all 500 pretty quickly and then um made some artwork in the art department and that was another cool thing I was like I can sell these things for 10 bucks and to my friends and what's funny is that you can't even sell a CD for 10 bucks anymore <laughs> it's like what's what's happened it's the only commodity that's gone down in price anywhere it's the only thing <laughs> what's up with that but anyway, um, it was fun. It was fun to, so I got some gigs around campus and uh, started booking my own shows. I played a place called um, Brick Street Theater, I think it was called, or no, it was called something else when I was there, but I played around town and played my own. I had a, a weekly gig for a while that I played and um, had a little following around campus and had my music out there and then, um, I got heard by somebody on campus that had interned at RCA Records, I guess, and he knew a guy in Philadelphia that wanted to give me a production deal and try to get me a record deal. So I ended up playing my first show in New York City, probably like later that summer after my senior year. I played at Fez, the same place that, well, it wasn't the place that Jeff Buckley played, but it was the same name that uh, you read about in his book, and I was a huge fan of his. So. Um, so yeah, one thing just kind of led to another. And then a couple of years after that, I'd, I had been in Nashville for six months and I got signed to Network Records and um, they put an album out. And none of that, was that the album before Lost and Found? No, Lost and Found was the first. I made another album in Nashville called Upland that kind of mm -hmm. some of the songs got onto Lost and Found, but Lost and Found was the first record that a label put out. And um, my family was like, couldn't believe that my music was in Barnes and Noble and Best Buy and stuff like that in our home. I mean, it really sounds like it happened pretty fast. I mean, I know that's a few years get uh, the story right there, but it's not like you got some songs together in a band and toured the country for four years. Uh, and then it's kind of your buddy, whoever your buddy was on campus, it really kind of hooked you up with someone that liked. I mean, it sounds like you the right ears at the right time. That was a dead end. That that whole thing because I moved to Philly with with that guy and hit a total dead end for like six wow. months in Philly. But I did continue to write and play there. And I had a weekly gig there playing at an Irish pub. And then um, the guy I moved there with, like essentially just moved out of the house one day without telling me that he was going to. And, um, and then I had to move back to Ohio. And subsequently my dad also just moved out. He left my mom and my sister. So my parents were getting a divorce and I was in Philly. My deal didn't work out there at all. And I just decided I'm going to move home. And my friend um, who's living in Nashville said, why don't you come down here and live with, with me? You can do some music down here. So I came back to Ohio for that Christmas and holiday season and ended up staying around too long. And it was almost like looking like I was not even going to move to Nashville. I was just going to be at home. And, uh, Someone wrote me, one of my friends, they're like, what are you doing? If you don't get out of there now, you're just going to stay there. Like, get your butt down there. And I packed the car the next day and came to Nashville. And um, I was only in Nashville for a couple months before, I think it was only like three months before, like, major labels were calling me. And I was just like, I wasn't going, like, what's happening because... I thought it was going to happen that way, but I didn't, I was so the naivety of that to just think sometimes when you're a kid, you just kind of believe that anything can happen. And that was an instance where looking back, 
I go, man, the odds of that actually happening the way you hoped that it might are pretty slim. And you're right. Like when I look back, I'm like, I just moved down here with some, with a guitar and some songs and somehow created Nashville was smaller then. it was a different town. And I don't know what happened, but I think I was just so focused on what I was doing and so passionate about it. And I was lucky enough to have some friends around town who were very social because I'm not social. I'm an introvert and they introduced me to a lot of people. And I think people just saw like, Hey, this guy's like a real, he's got something going on. Like he's very focused, especially for someone who's like 23 years old, like he's doing it, you know, and somehow the music industry heard about that. And I guess that's the way it works, you know? So everybody's got a, got a unique story and that's kind of mine. That's, I love it. That's a great story. And also I think a good place to strum a song for us. If you got yeah. one, I'm going to play one of those early ones. This is one off of lost and found that you oh, drove cool. away. <laughs> seven hours to see. And, and real, real quick, this is Griffin house guys. If you haven't, uh, if you're just tuning in, thanks for being here. Dressing my voice up on the phone Underneath the envy rotting my bones I'd do anything to get you alone Just for a while Blame it on the way that I talk You can blame it on the way that I look You can blame it on the stuff that I drank And the pills that I took Tell me a lie, if it's true. Have you done all the things I never wanted you to? you every night when I go to sleep laying there wrapped up in his arms how we used to be and are you seriously falling in love or do you do it just to get back at me I deserve to take it I guess I just wish we could be Tell me a lie, if it's true. Have I done all the things I never wanted to do? just get it solved. Tripping myself up on my words. I'm writing checks that I couldn't cash. I rip them up and throw them away. Then I take them out of the trash. You won't believe me if I promise again. I'm telling you that I can change. At the top of my lungs, but it's out of my range. Tell me a lie, if it's true. Have you done all the things I never wanted you to? Tell me a lie, if it's true.
Love that song. Uh, this is Griffin House you're listening to. And if you're just joining us, welcome to uh, my new little live conversation series, Talk to Me, where I just call up my musical friends during this time and talk to them for an hour or so. Um, that song is definitely my uh, my gateway uh, Griffin House drug song or whatever. That's that, that's the one that hooked me. And yeah. uh, and I just I, I was a fan ever since the that song. So Thanks, it's a good one. Uh, that was the first love. one that when I wrote it down here, when I moved to Nashville, I was like, felt like a song that was on another level. Like I, I had been writing 100 and 200 level class songs, at least it felt that way. And then when that one happened, I was like, that's like a 400 level song. Like that's sort of an album worthy one that would be on something that I would listen to maybe. And I don't know what it was, but sometimes a song comes along and, teaches you something and um all the hard work that you've been doing that you don't think is going anywhere shows up one day and and expresses itself in its own little creation and um they tend to just fall out of your in your lap out of nowhere or seemingly nowhere but it, i guess it's like when you do training and then <laughs> well I, that's a good segue here. Um, I mean, I've got a bunch of notes of stuff ready for this, but we're we're jumping all over and we're not going to get to everything. But I do, I can't not not talk about this, but uh, talk about just the, all the songs you released since then and you put out a handful of records. But then in 2006, um, your Homecoming record comes out and that's when, um, you know, the guy that says goodbye to you about, is out of his mind, which I would assume, I feel like a lot of um, fans that I meet anyway, that's how they, uh, that's their gateway into to finding you in, in your songs. I was even one time I was like busking on the street for fun one time and I was covering that song and some girl out of nowhere came up and goes, that's Griffin house. And I was like, yeah. And I think you were coming up and playing like one of my shows. And I was like, you should come to the show. I gave her a flyer and she came, which is really cool. I sold a ticket. Um, but so, I mean, at that point when that song came out, I mean, I don't know if it, I know it came out on the next record as well. So I don't know at which one it got picked up on radio yeah. and what have you but i feel like that did you feel your career just take a total shift after that yeah. song hit the it, it was it was more it was a song that i think got an immediate response at shows and i think it, it started to circulate around fans a little bit and then um the weird thing about that song is that it was out on homecoming and i knew that it, there was something special about it but um, Network never put it out to radio, which was really funny. They never, I thought I was supposed to be doing more like Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker stuff or more like faster rock and roll, big choruses, all the producers that they would put me with would put, try to write a song like that. And I would show them this song, The God Says Goodbye to You, which essentially doesn't even have a chorus. It's like one long verse with a, some repetition of verses, uh, you know, end lines, just like something a writer like Bob Dylan might do or something where they're ne not necessarily a chorus. It's more a verse or um, Folsom Prison Blues doesn't have a chorus. So, you know, it's just like that. So I thought, well, what's wrong with that? But none of the producers that they would put me with at the time, like really wanted to touch that song. And it was, they didn't think of it. It was a single. And a couple of years later, they came to me and, and they were like looking at the, the numbers basically. And they were like, you need to sing this song like every night at, at, at like the pinnacle of the set because this song is is like a hundred times more popular than every single other one of your songs and they didn't really know why but at that point like I don't think we we still didn't like put it out to radio I don't know why it seems like um I had no idea that the song had taken on that much of a life of, of its own until one night I was out on the road and um in the middle of the tour in 2009 and we showed up at the double door in Chicago and just thinking it was going to be like a decent crowd, you know, Chicago was always pretty good. And we went out for a drink or something with my sister and her friend and we came back and there were like barricades up. There's like 500 people up there. Security's like <laughs> shuffling us in and we're, we had no idea what was happening. It was a sold out show at the double door and we didn't, it was like, what happened? And then the rest of the tour was just, like twice as many people as we were used to. And um, 
I didn't really know it at the time, but like what I think had happened is, is that basically that song uh, caught on, like you were saying, and people, people started to get a, an underground following. And we made a video for it too that year, which I think probably helped get it out there a lot on YouTube. It was a cool video with, um, that I made with my friend from Sweden and he did the whole thing, shot it in black and white, and he used um, a bunch of different uh, looking people from all different walks of life in the video and just, I don't know how to, like we didn't use models or professional actors. We just got people off the street, uh, ordinary folks to come in and, and be in the video. And I think we created enough diversity in the video that um, I think coupled with the song sent a really nice message of the guy that says goodbye to you is out of his mind. And it's it's been a song that's been great to me over the years. So. It's got to feel good, like, and, and you're on such a good stride, too, after, uh, you know, a couple great records, and then uh, uh, and then that song comes out. You go from playing Hotel Utah in San Francisco to, you know, better stages. Yeah, for <laughs> No sure. offense to Hotel Utah, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember you were playing, I can't remember what year it was. It must have been 07, and you were, I think you were touring with Matt Kearney, and yeah. you were just opening, and I went to see you at Great American. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that song. You played it at that show. And oh, yeah. I remember yeah. I remember the response. And and from myself, too. It was just like, oh, my God. It's just so honest, but it just flows so well. And uh, I don't know. You could definitely feel the response uh, mm -hmm. playing that song. So Because, I mean, like when you're playing solo, it also tends to be more of an intimate thing, you yeah. know, versus with a band. And I feel lucky I've gotten to see you pl play with a band, mm -hmm. which is a rare thing uh, outside of probably – Nashville, I assume, uh, or outside yeah. the Midwest, anyway. Um, and it really is cool seeing your songs. Yeah, it's fun playing with the band. Yeah. Um, so I definitely want to talk about the documentary as well. So Rising Star. So how did the documentary come together? Why, like, why did why did it happen? Did someone approach you? Is this something you yeah. really wanted to get down? Or yeah, a filmmaker um, named Shane Drake, who's who's been he has a name for himself from shooting videos. He won a VMA for a Panic at the Disco and has, has won several um, CMA awards for videos for people like Carrie Underwood and um, Tim McGraw. And, uh, I met him through a friend in LA and he knew my music. It turned out that when I met him, he, he had bought Lost and Found at Amoeba Records in LA, like in Hollywood back in the 2004 or something. And when I met him, he didn't put together that when I said, hey, my name's Griffin House, he thought the thing was a band and then he put two and two together and text me which <laughs> by the way not to interrupt you i just want to uh, dive in like every time i say have you heard of griffin house like who are they i do get yeah. that a lot and for the record that is his real name so <laughs> yeah, not really. anyway sorry didn't mean to interrupt sure. sorry all right no that's all we made the movie because of him it was his idea and it sounded great to me i felt like i had something particular to say at that point in time and um so we got a our friend John Lynch and we all made the film together. He, he put up the money to do it and we went out, Shane donated his time and um, I donated my songs and we all came together and made a, made a movie. So. And it's very, it's a very vulnerable. You share a lot about yourself. It's personal. And yeah. you even saying earlier that you are an introvert, although you're a performer in front of lots of people. Um, was, how did, how was, was that hard for you to speak to a camera? Like, you know, sitting across the table there and sharing some very, you know, intimate things about your personal life and yeah, who you some are. stuff I didn't want, really want to talk about because, like, he'd ask me really personal questions about my dad or something, and I, I didn't know the answer to the question, and he would sometimes he would say like, "Come on, you gotta you gotta open up, like you gotta reveal more." It wasn't that I was withholding; it's just I didn't know. I didn't know the answer to my own question, you know? And it, so there were certain things that even if I wanted to talk about were too hard to talk about because if I forced myself to say something, then I felt like I was saying something I didn't know if it was true or not. I'm just trying to fill, fill up time. But the main goal was just to try to be as honest as possible in the movie and be, be myself, which is what I, I try to do on stage and off stage anyway. So um, following that rule, I felt like I couldn't really go wrong and just try to be me as much as I could, whoever that is. <laughs> was it, was it easy or hard to look back and watch it when it, when it was finished? Um, 
it was great to watch it. It was, I felt like we made something really, really meaningful and beautiful and we worked really hard on it and we were very, our whole family was really happy with the outcome of it and felt very, very proud of it. So it's a movie that if we made a movie today, I, it wouldn't even be close to the same movie, but I think we had to go through that to, I think making that movie helped me on, in my personal growth as an artist and as a person for sure. And so it was necessary to, to do that no matter what. And I feel like a different person now, even a year later. So that's really cool. Again, uh, that movie is called uh, rising star with Griffin house and you can, you can watch it on Amazon uh, prime and it's worth checking out for sure. Please do that. Um, so what, what is next for you? I know that you're in the middle of a move. Uh, you know, you've got the rising star um, yeah. soundtrack album out, the movies out. Do you have something kind of queued up uh, for what's next, or is there a little little pause? I don't know. For everything? I really don't know anything other than we're moving on Friday. We're going to a cabin in the woods in Connecticut. We're saying goodbye to Nashville. I don't know when the world's going to open up again so that I can go play shows, but I I hope that that's in um, future sometime soon because I really miss playing for people it's a huge part of who I am to connect with folks live and I, I love 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 doing it and this time has made me appreciate how much I actually do love doing it um, travel is very difficult though as well and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this time of like being an artist and being a writer and I feel like during these past two months I've probably written some of the best songs I've ever written in my life so the plan is just to go up to that cabin and record some of them and and try to put them out there in the world. That's really exciting. Uh, I can't wait. I'm sure your kids are pretty psyched to have you home. <laughs> yeah, it's been great to be with everybody. They, they've awesome. made some uh, cameos in your online shows. Yeah. Uh, there was one, I think it was, it may have been, I think it was one of the Facebook ones, and they just came up out of nowhere, <laughs> like yeah. popped in. And uh, I always like your reaction to your kids when, if they're, interrupting like a performance in front of you know 300 people on your facebook yeah. uh you're never impatient you don't feel you're just like hey guys what's going on like i just love your relationship with your kids and it just feels like um they're a top prior your family's top priority in life you, yeah. you definitely reflect that just in your mannerism <laughs> in uh, a stressful moment on a, on a show i love them so much and i want to spank them sometimes i wish i could spank them sometimes you know that's how, that's how I got treated, but I'm like, this seems like it would work a lot better than whatever I'm doing right now that's not working. Can I just spank him? No, I don't think you can. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, man, I'm excited for your move, and I hope it goes well. Um, and I'm really happy you joined us uh, today in this conversation, and I hope that some fans out there learned a little bit uh, more about you that they didn't uh, already Thanks know. And I, I did, and well, it's always good to see you, and I really appreciate you having me on, man. I appreciate you inviting me to do it. appreciate uh, years of that we've known each other and worked together it's been been awesome it's it's really fun to you know drive to chicago see a guy in 2004 and then be able to call you up and be like hey do you want to be on my <laughs> whatever thing while we're not uh doing anything <laughs> okay uh, cool. uh could you leave us with a song would that be cool yeah let's do this one thanks man thank you griffin It can be a real long road It can be a lonely night When you're on your own And you're running out of light It can be a real long ride So when the time is right, don't hold back. When the time is right, don't hold back. Doesn't matter who you are. 
Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter where you start, only matters where you end. Uh, Griffin House, oh, man, I'm thankful to have you here today, and uh, uh, I'm sure you'll be doing some more online shows that folks can check out once uh, sure. you get settled and get your internet figured out in the woods there. <laughs> We'll get back to Friday nights probably soon, soon enough. Maybe cool. next Friday even, who knows. This Friday we're driving, so not this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Don't forget the link in the comments below. You can get all of Griffin's merchandise. You can throw a couple bucks to support this podcast if you want. The next uh, Talk To Me episode is actually this Thursday, May 21st, with Birds of Chicago. So I'm really excited to have them on. Uh, I think they're in Nashville as well. So they're it's, cool it's Nashville week. It's Nashville. Yeah, they're, they're, they're cool folks. They are very cool. I'm super excited to have them. And, and for those of you that missed the beginning of this, it'll be up to uh, view again uh, after we're done here, and I'll also put it on YouTube. But I cannot thank you enough. Griffin House, love you, buddy. Thank you, my friend. Love you, too. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everyone. Stay s safe and healthy, and uh, thanks for tuning in.